you're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and for this week's show I'll be reviewing four movies none of which are Transformers The Last Night. I told my dedicated listening audience, and I hope that uh, (laughs) you're included in the dedicated listening audience, but anyway, I told them that I would not review Transformers The Last Night, not because I would think it was vicariously a bad movie, although there is that, but one of my rules with sequels is I don't review a sequel unless I've seen the original movies first. And I think with Transformers The Last Night, I haven't seen the other Transformers movies, so I can't exactly say whether Transformers The Last Night was good or bad. You would have to make that decision if you were going to go out and see that movie if you haven't seen it already. I will tell you, though, that to start off our segment, What's Topping the Box Office, Transformers The Last Night has debuted at number one at the box office. This weekend, it didn't gross too much, or at least not compared to Wonder Woman or Cars 3. Just uh, last weekend, Cars 3 debuted to a $75 million international gross. This weekend, Transformers The Last Night made $44.7 million, and that is against a budget of $217 million. So Transformers The Last Night does have a long way to go in the United States to recoup its budget, a very long way, but internationally already, Transformers The Last Night has so far grossed $269 million. So I guess that goes to show you that Transformers is still... (sighs) unfortunately a sure bet at the box office in that people not just in america but all over the world go to see it so there will probably be a sixth movie sorry movie purists however it's not a hit yet here in the united states but around the world it is a tentative hit wonder woman is number two at the box office this weekend it was number one last week as well in its fourth week in release this weekend it made 24.9 million dollars Against a budget of $149 million, Wonder Woman has so far made $318.1 million in the United States and $653.9 million around the world, making it already a certified hit here in the States and globally. Cars 3 was number one at the box office when it debuted last week. This weekend, it dropped to number three, but not too bad in terms of numbers. This weekend, it made $24.1 million in the United States. Against a budget of $175 million, Cars 3 has so far made $98.8 million here in the States and $140.9 million around the world, which means it's neither a hit here in the States, or around the world yet. And that falls short, especially for a Pixar movie. However, it does have time, especially since it's only been out for two weeks, to recoup its budget maybe next week or maybe even the week after. Either way, it has time. And it's probably not going to drop from the top five anytime soon. 47 Meters Down was number five at the box office last week. This week, it's the only movie to climb one spot to number four. It's the only movie to climb, period. So it goes to show you that 47 Meters Down is actually doing really well by way of word of mouth. This weekend, it grossed $7.1 million. Against a budget of $5 million, 47 Meters Down has so far grossed in the United States $23.9 million. Now, that pales in comparison to Wonder Woman and Cars 3, but for a movie with such a modest budget, it's doing extremely well and is a certified hit here in the States. I don't have the information for how it's doing globally, but if it's a certified hit in the States, it is vicariously a certified hit around the world. The Mummy is still a movie that, excuse me, is struggling. This weekend, The Mummy made $6.1 million. Against a budget of $125 million, The Mummy has so far made in the United States $68.7 million, and around the world has made $343.9 million, which means it's not a hit here in the States and probably never will be, but around the world it's already certified, which gives some hope to Universal Studios' Dark Universe series, hopefully. 
All Eyes on Me, the Tupac Shakur movie, or the Tupac Shakur story, was number three at the box office last week. This week, it surprisingly dropped to number six, having only grossed $5.8 million. But against a budget of $40 million, All Eyes on Me has so far grossed $38.6 million here in the States and $43.8 million around the world, which is, means it's not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a tentative hit. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, is still sailing high, I had to use that pun, at number seven, falling last week from number six. This weekend, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, grossed $5.4 million. Against a budget of $230 million, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, has so far grossed $160.2 million here in the States and $680 million around the world. So very much like The Mummy, except more successfully, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, as is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is so far a certified hit. So I think we're bound to see a sixth movie, which unlike the fifth Transformers movie, will probably be welcome, at least as long as it still has Johnny Depp in it. Rough Night is number eight at the box office this weekend, sliding from number seven last week. And this is a movie that is destined to bomb. I'm going to tell you that much. This weekend, Rough Night grossed $4.7 million. Against a budget of $20 million, Rough Night has so far grossed $16.6 million here in the States and $24.2 million around the world. So it's not a hit yet here in the States. It could be by next week, given how much it pulled in this week. But around the world, it is a tentative hit already. Captain Underpants, the first epic movie, is number nine at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number eight last week. This weekend, it grossed $4.3 million. Against a budget of $38 million, Captain Underpants has so far grossed $65.7 million here in the States and $71.9 million worldwide. So it's made the bulk of its money here in the States, but it's a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I'll just tell you straight up, it's a certified hit Well, at least around the world, it's a tentative hit here in the States. It grossed $3 million this weekend against a budget of $200 million. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has so far grossed $380.2 million here in the States and $851.4 million around the world. So it is a tentative hit here in the States. It is very, very close to becoming certified. It only needs to make less than $20 million to become certified, but my guess is that it will, slowly but surely. So as I said earlier in the show, I did not actually see Transformers the last night. I told you guys last week, I'm going to sit this one out. Not because of the bad reputation of Transformers as a franchise, although that doesn't help, but mainly because of my rule that I don't see sequels unless I've seen the original movies. I have not seen any of the Transformers movies to date, ergo... I skipped out on Transformers the last night, but from the reviews I've caught, I probably haven't been missing much. So instead, the four movies I'm going to be reviewing for this show are mainly independent movies. The first movie I'm going to review is a movie from India called Tube Light, which is directed by Kabir Khan, who also wrote the screenplay. And as far as I know, Tube Light is a fictional movie, but it takes place primarily in 1962 during the Indochina War, which is a war that India fought with China with whom they're neighbors. But it's the story of a man's unshakable faith in himself and the love for his family. That's the vague tagline of the movie. But what it's really about is about a somewhat absent-minded and unlucky unlucky man by the name of Laxman, who's played in this movie by Indian actor Salman Khan. And he has a very fruitful and loving relationship with his brother Bharat, his younger brother, who's played by Sohail Khan. So the two of them grow up in what could be considered harmony. In fact, I think Western audiences, if they go to see this movie, will probably be taken aback by how close these brothers are in this movie. I know, having been a younger brother myself, my brother and I did not get along. I mean, we get along great now, but growing up, (laughs) we didn't get along nearly as well as these two guys did. So you're probably asking yourself, what is with the name of the movie Tube Light, and what is a tube light? Well, a tube light is another name for a fluorescent bulb, and it's actually the name that 
Laxman is given as a youth. The story behind it is there was a British missionary who came to this small town in which Laxman lives in India to teach. And one of the things he brought with him was a fluorescent bulb, which in the late 40s was a, a pretty new innovation. And the thing with this fluorescent light or this, this tube light is that it didn't shine all the way upon being turned on. At, at first, it, it flickered, and then it ultimately shone. So because Laxman is considered almost the village idiot in his village, he's given the name Tube Light because his intelligence is just not there yet. It just kind of flickers on and off. But the villagers give him this name, or at least the mean-spirited ones, not realizing that eventually a Tube Light shines and doesn't stop shining. Unfortunately, the the technology for these fluorescent lights hasn't changed too much, but I guess that's just a grievance of mine. But anyway, back to the movie. So the two brothers' lives change forever when the when the country of India declares war on China and its borders. And I'm not exactly sure what the history is behind the Indochina War. I think China probably started the war by trying to invade India, and the, the rest of, is literally history. But both Laxman and Bharat trained to be in the Indian Army, and Laxman, not only not because of his intellect, but because he's just not physically capable of being in the army is turned down, much to his chagrin. But Bharat is accepted into the army and eventually goes to fight in Indochina. So there are a number of subplots in here. One of them actually involves Laxman having an encounter with none other than Mahatma Gandhi. And Mahatma Gandhi's teachings become prevalent in this movie, especially when there are Chinese Indians, or rather people who have Chinese ancestry who settled in India, who eventually settle in their hometown. And at first, Laxman gets on his bike and warns the villagers that the Chinese are coming, only to find that he accidentally sets up the, this Chinese family, which consists of a woman and her son, to accidentally be oppressed by the majority of the villagers. So there are some touching scenes where Laxman realizes the error of his ways, and he tries to make amends with this Chinese family. And the scenes between him and the mother, whose name is Li Ling, who's played by Zuzu, and also her son Gu, who's played by Matin Ray Tangu, are actually, for the most part, sweet. I think the movie seems to lose its footing when there are two particular song and dance numbers that are placed in the movie that I don't think really should have been there. I mean, I do get what the Bollywood movies are about, and I do know that Bollywood movies that involve singing and dancing get a lot of a, a lot of praise from Indian moviegoers and maybe that doesn't exactly translate particularly well here but in this movie I thought the the song and dance numbers seemed very out of place especially since there's one in the very beginning and there's one in the middle towards the end and that's it and this is a movie that's 2 hours and 20 minutes long so I I was Maybe my issues with this movie were more of a cultural misunderstanding, but I did think that the dramatic scenes in this movie were touching. There were some scenes where I actually shed tears, but I give it my rating of a checkout. I don't think most Western audiences will understand this movie particularly well, but there are some things they'll get out of it. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Abacus, Small Enough to Jail. What is Abacus? Abacus is a small bank that's actually run in Chinatown, New York, by Chinese immigrants. In fact, the, the, the person who started the uh, Abacus bank is a man who actually immigrated to New York City from Shanghai in the early 60s. And after obtaining a law degree from a prestigious 
college in the United States. He had first practiced law and defended people in Chinatown, only to find that Chinatown in New York needed a bank. So he began the bank Abacus. And what does Abacus mean? Is it a, a Chinese word? Sort of. But Abacus is actually the name of a very ancient Chinese calculator. And it's one that was made centuries before even the most basic computers were ever invented. And if, you, if you've ever, you, you would know an Abacus calculator if you saw one. I'm not exactly sure how to use it. It is very basic, but anyway. So what is the significance of Abacus? Well, it is a small financial institution. As I said, it's located in Chinatown in New York City, but it's significant because it is the only company that was criminally indicted in the wake of the U.S. 2008 mortgage crisis. It is the only one. And What's really unfortunate about this is even though the United States has rebounded from the Great Recession of 2008, there has been no one who has been jailed uh, amongst bankers, amongst people in Wall Street for the mortgage crisis and the consequent financial collapse of 2008. And this movie brings up a really good point that why was this bank, Abacus, which was not, not only a small bank, but a reputable bank, and has also issued legitimate mortgages or legitimate loans towards residents of Chinatown, why were they the only one that was indicted? So the movie, very much like other movies about the financial crisis, goes through a lot of very dense financial material, which if you're not practicing financial law or you're not involved in banking, you probably won't be able to follow all of this. However, at one hour and 28 minutes, there is enough in this movie to keep you compelled. And the movie is directed by Steve James, who's one of my favorite documentary directors. He's the one who's brought us movies such as Hoop Dreams and also another one, which is actually one of my favorite documentaries, Roger Ebert, Life Itself, which I think is actually called Life Itself, but it's about the life and actually the death of Roger Ebert, who was actually one, who Stephen James is actually one of his favorite directors or documentary filmmakers as well. So Steve James knows how to tell a compelling story. In this case, he's telling a compelling story using a lot of very dry and dense technical terms. And I think this movie is almost like applying a tongue to sandpaper. It gets it a little bit more... I'm, I'm trying to use action, um, relevant terminology. Makes it a little bit more interesting, but there's still a lot to process here. But in short, so as not to bore you guys... Abacus and the people who ran the, the bank, all of whom were of Chinese descent, either from China or born in the United States, were indicted and were facing 50 counts of fraud and a number of other serious charges. I'm not going to tell you exactly how the court proceedings played out, but there is enough there are enough interviews in this documentary that with not only the family that runs the abacus bank but also the lawyers who were defending abacus and also the prosecuting attorneys to actually make this story more human and i really respected the movie for that i although i did think to myself well there is enough evidence against this bank to to show that there was some wrongdoing, but was that wrongdoing actually intentional? And it turns out that there was one employee who actually 
worked for the bank, and I, I do emphasize worked because he no longer works there anymore, who did take out fraudulent loans and was found by the bank to have dealt with money laundering and other illegal activities. And I think that was probably the catalyst for bringing Abacus to trial to face more serious charges. However, the movie does detail that the family that runs the Abacus Bank actually dealt with this person immediately. They did report him, and they fired him. And actually, that former bank employee for Abacus is now serving time in prison. But was Abacus actually indicted for this one employee's wrongdoing? Or were they indicted because they were a small bank? Or were they indicted because they were run by a minority? And the movie doesn't answer that, but it, lead, it leads you to question what the motivation behind the prosecuting attorneys were. And there is some significance in the subtitle of this movie, Small Enough to Jail, because there's one attorney that says, well, a lot of these big banks that were responsible for the mortgage crisis were big enough to fail. Apparently, this one was small enough to jail. So the movie gets my rating of a checkout. It's a movie that will not appeal to everyone. It has a lot of as I said, very dry material in it, but the human aspect of it, especially the the interviews that Steve James gets for this documentary, makes it very worth watching. And it also makes you question the, the judicial system as a whole. The next movie I'm going to review for you is The Bad Batch. This is the latest from writer and director Anna Lily Amirpour. And if that name doesn't sound familiar to you, you might have caught a film she did three years ago, which was a black and white film of the vampire genre called A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Now, you, I wouldn't have guessed from watching The Bad Batch that the director who directed A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night basically directed the same movie that I was watching. The, and there are quite a few differences, whereas The Bad Batch is more of a dystopian thriller with some comedy elements and bore a similarity in a lot of ways to films made by Quentin Tarantino. A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night is a very stark black and white movie that's also a horror film. So I like that Anna Lily Amirpour is able to change things around a little bit and not make two movies which are the same. And for that, I give her a lot of credit. However, very much like, or maybe even more than A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, the Bad Batch is a weird, weird movie. It's a little drama. It's a little sci-fi. It's a little action. And it's, it's, it's categorized as romance sci-fi. I, I'm not sure exactly where the romance is in this film. But anyway, it is a love story that's set in the community of cannibals in a future dystopia. In a desert wasteland in Texas, or maybe it's part Mexico as well, a muscled cannibal breaks one important rule. Don't play with your food. That's the tagline of the movie. To get into more specifics, there's a woman who's just released from prison named Arlen, and she's played by Suki Waterhouse. And Suki Waterhouse is a beautiful young woman who's been in actually quite a few films as of late. She was in Insurgent two years ago. She played Kitty Bennett in Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, and she also played the role of Bethany in Love, Rosie. She is a British actress, and here she actually has a pretty thick uh, southern accent, so I'm not exactly sure why they didn't keep her British, but I, I guess just for accuracy, I guess, or geographical accuracy. But anyway, after she's released from prison, she wanders the desert only to be kidnapped against her will, and ultimately... She has her arm and her leg literally sawed off as she is awake. So, yeah, as you can already tell, not the most pleasant of films. But anyway, when she makes her escape, which is actually on her back on a skateboard, a drifter who's, who's only known as Hermit and who's actually played by Jim Carrey, yes, that Jim Carrey, brings her to a settlement which is called Comfort. Comfort. 
And it's run by a very charismatic leader by the name of The Dream, who's played by Keanu Reeves. And of course, he has the charisma factor going on, but eventually you find that there is a seedy underbelly to The Dream's charisma. And ultimately, it, it sometimes seems you never really know who is Arlen's friend in this dystopian wasteland and who is her enemy. It might seem some one way when you're first watching this film, but eventually as the film progresses, you find it's something entirely different. And there are scenes in this movie of dismemberment, of cannibalism, and all of these scenes are very unpleasant to watch. And eventually you find that the character of the dream, Keanu Reeves's character, is not only, well, the, has a seedy underside to him, but that seedy underside includes making several women <laughs> under his watch pregnant. So he is not only a, uh, a dubious leader, but he's also a polygamist. And polygamists are, by nature, extremely creepy. So there are a lot of surprises to The Bad Batch. I can't say this is a movie that I loved, but it is a movie that did hold my attention. And also, as I said, Jim Carrey is in this movie. It's a very understated role for him, and it's a very weird role for him. Yeah, Bruce Almighty and Ace Ventura, this is not. But it is interesting to see what Jim Carrey does with this role, especially since he doesn't talk throughout the entire movie. So you're kind of watching him and wondering. At first you, you see him and you think to yourself, holy cow, that's Jim Carrey. But the other... But on the other hand, you're thinking, is he going to be funny or is he going to play this completely straight? And I, I got to give Jim Carrey some credit for taking these kinds of supporting roles that are, in fact, risky. But I'd really, as much as I'd really like to see Jim Carrey do a comedy again, it is cool to see him take these kinds of risks, especially in movies. And maybe he'll do so a little later with... TV shows. You, you, you never really know. But anyway, in addition to Suki Waterhouse and Keanu Reeves, and of course, as I said, Jim Carrey, Diego Luna is in this film in a very unrecognizable part. In fact, so unrecognizable, I can't remember who he is. But there's also a standout role from Jason Momoa, who plays a guy who's only known as Miami Man or Miami Man. And this Miami man is not only a cannibal, but he also has a soft side for his daughter, Honey, who's played in this movie by a beautiful young actress named Jada Fink. So there are a lot of characters in this film. There is a lot going on. It bears... it. You can definitely see a lot of Quentin Tarantino inspiration in this movie, and whether or not... Anna Lily Amirpour meant this to be a tribute to Quentin Tarantino uh, is still kind of dubious and sort of the jury's still out on that one, on, on that argument. But it, it certainly has that Quentin Tarantino-like feel to it. And I have the feeling that this will be a cult classic in the next couple of years, should it be given the distribution it deserves. But as for me, I give it my rating of a checkout. I don't think it's altogether a great movie in the sense that I didn't really know exactly where the narrative was going, which, yes, makes it unpredictable, but I couldn't exactly sense a story. I did think the characters and their motivations were intriguing. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Journey. The Journey is a British-Irish drama film directed by Nick Ham. And Nick Ham is a director from Belfast, Northern Ireland, who has previously directed a few films you might have heard of. There's one he directed in 1998 starring Monica Potter called The Very Thought of You. And he also directed, probably most notably, the movie Godsend from 2004, which starred Robert De Niro, Greg Kinnear, and Rebecca Romaine, which was not particularly well-received, but that's just one of the movies you probably heard of from him. And The Journey is actually a film that bears a resemblance to a number of politically charged movies in which the primary 
plot is that two people are talking. The one that came the most to mind was probably Frost Nixon, but I was also reminded by uh, reminded of a number of plays I've actually seen, including one where the spirits of Niels Bohr and Eisenberg actually come together and talk about their invention of the atomic bomb and how they might have, well, their regrets and remorses of that invention. It it was a fascinating play. If only I could remember the name of it. But the journey is very much like that. It is a fictional account of the extraordinary story of two implacable enemies in Northern Ireland, Firebrand, Democratic Unionist Party leader Ian Paisley, and Seen Fine politician Martin McGuinness. And just to give you an idea, Ian Paisley uh, is from Northern Ireland, from Belfast, and Martin McGuinness is from mainland Ireland and was allegedly the founder of the controversial group the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, who many brand not unreasonably as a terrorist group. But anyway, these two are forced to take a short journey together in which they will take the biggest leap of faith and change the course of history. And when I said that, this reminded me very much of Frost Nixon. It also kind of reminded me of My Dinner with Andre, except the only difference was My Dinner with Andre just took place at a, at a dining room table. It didn't take place anywhere else. Whereas this conversation takes place primarily in the back of a car, but there are some complications that lead both of these leaders to get out of the car and talk amongst themselves. I'm not going to give you the details about why they get out of the car, but there are reasons behind them doing this. So the the... The conversation between them, in other words, the words that are exchanged between the two leaders are fictional. In other words, they were made up, but the two of them actually did take a trip like this, and by the time the two of them got out, this this movie actually takes place in 2006, by the time the two of them got out, the conflict between Ireland and Northern Ireland was over after after decades of fighting. So I think to really understand this movie, you would have to know the history of the conflict between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And this movie, unfortunately, goes along the presumption or the assumption that you know this, this history from the very beginning. And even being an Irish American, I have been confused between, or not confused, but perplexed about why Ireland, Northern Ireland have have fought. I know that Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, whereas Ireland isn't. But I never really understood why Northern Ireland, which is made up primarily of Protestants, and mainland Ireland, made up primarily of Catholics, were at odds with one another. Obviously, one believed in, or one followed the Pope, and one didn't, but why couldn't they settle their differences after so many decades? In fact, going into centuries. Well, I think that the conflict between Ireland and Northern Ireland is over, but I wasn't really convinced, even after seeing this movie, that the conflict would just end after this car ride. And I don't exactly know that that it actually did. I know that Martin McGinnis and Ian Paisley did set aside their differences and actually work together magnanimously in the years to come. But I don't exactly know if this car ride, which they took, these two enemies, um, really settled the the conflict between the two sections of Ireland. But in any event, I do think that Timothy Spall and Cole Meany give very good performances as Ian Paisley and Martin McGinnis, respectively. Ian Paisley, it, played by Timothy Spall here, is as straight as an arrow and is very deeply rooted in his, in his Presbyterian beliefs, whereas Cole Meany, even though he's, or rather, seen uh, Martin McGinnis, whom Colmini plays in this movie, is 
Catholic, yes, but a lot more laid back and a lot more jovial than uh, in Paisley is. So th- there's a lot going on here. And I do think Timothy Spall probably had the best performance here as Ian Paisley. It is amazing the transformation through which Timothy Spall has gone over the last 20 years. Timothy Spall, you might remember from movies like Almost Famous and Vanilla Sky on the American side. He also played uh, the role of Wormtail in several Harry Potter movies, most notably Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And he has, I mean, definitely gone through a transformation physically in the sense that he was known for being relatively portly in about a decade ago. He has lost so much weight. I don't think it was primarily for this film because in another movie he was in recently with Rachel Weisz, which was, I forgot the name of it, it's where he played the Holocaust denier, and the movie was called Denial, where he played real-life Holocaust denier David Irving. He was also very thin. But the movie The Journey gets my rating of a checkout. I do think, because it's a conversation between two people, it can seem to be very slow at times, but there are interesting twists with the characters. I just don't really understand the significance of this conversation coming out of the film and how it solved the decades-long conference uh, conflict. So, normally I have five movies to review for a show. This week, because of the lack of films that came out, I only reviewed four. So, since it's the middle of June and I won't be back for July 4th, that is, the 4th of July this year is on a Tuesday, which means that this studio will be shut down, which means I won't be able to do my live show. I will be back the next week, though, to give you sort of a catching up on on movies that have come out. So I'll definitely have five to review for you two weeks from now, but this week I fell short. But since it's the begin it's the end of the first half of twenty seventeen, which is amazing, I thought I might just give you a rundown of what I think are the best movies of twenty seventeen so far. And there actually have been some very pleasant surprises There have been some high-profile movies that have bombed, like, well, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, and The Mummy is not doing especially well, neither is Rough Night. But I'm just going to give you a a synopsis of the movies that I've seen so far this year that have really, really stood out. And one of the best movies of the year, perhaps the best movie, has so far been Get Out. And Get Out has made history for a number of reasons. It's directed by Jordan Peele of the comedy duo Key and Peele. And Jordan Peele has made history by being the very first African-American director whose debut movie made more than $100 million at the box office. That's incredible. But in addition to that feat, I also thought this movie had very strong performances by the likes of most especially Daniel Kaluuya, who we'll probably see in a later film sometime soon. I, I, I think he's got, I, I think not only did he do well in that movie, but he also had a very iconic scene in that film where he's being hypnotized, and that was the image that went on some of the posters for Get Out. And I think that's, that's an image that's probably going to stay with people for years to come. I also thought that Allison Williams, Bradley Whitford, and Catherine Keener all did a really good job in this film, playing people who are, dis- uh, I might be spoiling a little bit, but they are deceptively welcome to this visitor of theirs. And it turns out there's, for lack of a better term, a seedy underside to their cordiality. So Get Out is one of the films that I think was probably the standout one of the year. I can't say whether it's going to be in my list of the top 10 best movies because a lot of great movies come out at the end of the year, but I'd say it's up there as well. I I would probably say the second best movie of the year so far has got to be Wonder Woman. And I think that Wonder Woman is a movie that pretty much saved the Justice League. In other words, one of my criticisms with with Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice when I reviewed it last year was the fact that 
it was very unfocused in its plot, and it also seemed to be in a hurry to catch up with Marvel Studios, particularly with the Avengers. And I think that if the movie had taken its time and maybe better established why Batman would be in conflict with Superman instead of the contrived reasons it did, it would have been a better movie. Also, while I liked the movie Suicide Squad better, I, I also thought that was also very unfocused in its, in its storytelling. I thought the characters were good. I, I certainly was, was drawn to a lot of the characters, but Wonder Woman was, is the movie that probably should have been made first, definitely before Suicide Squad, and most likely before Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. I think a lot of people have said they are tired of origin stories. I'm not tired of them. I'm tired of origin stories that, that basically skip over relevant plot details. And by that, I mean th there are some origin stories that show that a superhero has a certain superpower, but they don't explain exactly what it is. I think Captain America, the first Avenger, was guilty of that. Y you know that there is something significant about his, about his shield, but how does... How is he able to throw it and then get it back? Movie never explains that. Also, Deadpool skipped a lot of those details. For instance, if Deadpool is able to cut off a limb and have it grow back, why can't he heal his own skin? Movie never explains that. Wonder Woman, I think, gets to the, the bottom of what makes Diana, um, the princess of the Amazons, so special what makes Wonder Woman so special, and what she can do and what she can't do, her strengths and weaknesses. I think the movie balanced that out very well. I thought Gal Gadot did excellently as Wonder Woman. And I also thought a lot of the supporting characters, played by Chris Pine, Robin Wright, and Lucy Davis, also did really well. So Wonder Woman is shining at the box office right now. And unlike... Batman vs. Superman, Suicide Squad, and Man of Steel. It actually deserves to shine. And there is a Justice League movie that's coming out later this year. Gal Gadot is going to reprise her role as Wonder Woman. Henry Cavill's coming back as Superman. Ben Affleck is coming back as Batman. I'm not sure how good that movie's going to be, but now that Wonder Woman has done as well as it has, I'm very intrigued to... To see that film as well. So I don't have enough time to go into every movie that really pleasantly surprised me, but I, I will get into some of the movies that come out recently. All Eyes on Me, I thought was a fantastic biopic of Tupac and one that was a long time coming, but fortunately worth the wait. I also thought that 47 Meters Down was a movie that I at first dismissed as a ripoff or a knockoff of Jaws until I actually saw the movie it's myself and I was I was very pleasantly surprised with what they could do with that movie on such a low budget and let's see what else I got about 10 seconds left oh yeah Logan the other dark comic book movie that also did really well in my opinion and that's all I have to say Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the, now that I've reviewed all the movies I have to review and also gave you my synopsis of what I think are the best movies of 2017 so far, or just a couple of them, I'm now going to get into my segment of what's coming out next. These are the top movies that are coming out in theaters, usually near you, unless I say otherwise, this coming weekend. The big movie to come out the weekend before the 4th of July is Despicable Me 3. And this is a movie that I actually, I've got a rule with sequels, as I said, which justifies me not seeing Transformers The Last Night. And that rule is, I don't see the sequel unless I've seen the original ones first. And I've seen, actually, parts of the first one. I haven't seen the second one at all. I did see the Minions movie. I bet that probably qualifies me. Or I mean, I make up the rules, so it probably does qualify me to see the third movie. I don't think I'd get lost. I think Despicable Me is one of those franchises that's 
where every epi- uh, where every movie is episodic enough so that if you were to wander into part two without having seen part one, you won't get lost. So, in Despicable Me 3, Steve Carell returns as Gru, the evil mastermind wannabe, and he meets his long-lost, charming, cheerful, and more successful twin brother, Drew, who wants to team up with him for one last criminal heist. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think that Steve Carell is the voice of Gru as well as Drew. I could be wrong about that. But the voice talent of Despicable Me 3, besides Steve Carell, includes Kristen Wiig, Trey Parker of South Park, and Miranda Cosgrove, amongst other people. So I'll see this movie, and I'll let you know what I think about it two weeks from now. In fact, yeah, in case you missed my initial announcement, I'm not going to be here for next week's show on July 4th. So I will see you again on July 11th, or I will have you listen to me again on July 11th, depending on what format in which you're listening to me. The other movie that's coming out this coming weekend, that's coming out in theaters nationwide, is The House. This is the latest starring Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler, who I don't think have actually starred together in a movie so far. I know that... Amy Poehler has made a cameo in Anchorman 2 starring Will Ferrell, but I don't think the two of them have actually been starring in a movie together. But anyway, The House is a movie about a dad convincing his friends to start an illegal casino in his basement after he and his wife spend their daughter's college fund. So that actually looks pretty interesting. And uh, Amy Poehler and Will Ferrell are usually pretty funny on their own. Uh, So... I'd be interested to see how they are together. This movie is directed by Andrew J. Cohen, not Adam McKay. So whenever Will Ferrell is doing something separately from Adam McKay, it seems like the the movies that result are more Anchorman wannabes rather than uh, a movie as unique as Anchorman. Although there have been some movies that Will Ferrell have done, has done without Adam McKay that I thought were pretty good. But anyway... The house is coming out this coming weekend. I will see it in two weeks from now. I will let you know exactly what I think. There's another movie called Baby Driver, whose sneak previews have actually gotten a lot of really good buzz. This is a movie that opens on June 28th, and it's it's a move it's a movie about a young getaway driver who, after being coerced into working for a crime boss, finds himself taking part in a heist doomed to fail. This one's directed by Edgar Wright, who brought us Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. So Edgar Wright is definitely a fun director, and this is a movie he's doing without Simon Pegg or Nick Frost, kind of like Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, but I'm still very interested in seeing it because it has a number of people starring in it of note, including Kevin Spacey, Jamie Foxx, Lily James, and John Hamm. So it is written and directed by Edgar Wright. There's no one British in it that I know of, but I'm definitely going to see this movie. Two weeks from now, I'll let you know what I think. Another movie that's coming out, and it might be in limited release, is a movie called 13 Minutes. This is a movie that takes place in November of 1939 when World War II just started. And it's, it details George Elser's attempt to assassinate Adolf Hitler. And uh, apparently when that assassination attempt fails, he is arrested. During his confinement, he recalls the events leading up to his plot and his reasons for deciding to take such drastic action. So... This movie has nobody particularly famous in it. It's directed by a man by the name of Oliver Hirschbeagle. Hirschbeagle, excuse me. So, and he actually directed a great movie about Adolf Hitler called Downfall. And even if you have to read the bottom of the screen, I recommend seeing Downfall. I'm very interested to see 13 Minutes as well. But that wraps up Words on Film for today, June 27th, 2017. And as I said... I will not be back for July 4th because the studio's closed, so I'm going to be taking a holiday. But I will be back July 11th, and until I see you then, I'll see you at the movies.